Hi, my name is Andrew Lee, and I'm the editor of the NeuroConnection for Ophthalmology Times. So a lot of things have changed for neuro-ophthalmology in my clinic, and I'm sure it's the same in clinics all across this country, both for ophthalmology and other providers. We, in the beginning, we rescheduled all the non-urgent and elective patients, and we rescheduled them to after the peak surge occurs to reduce the risk and try and flatten the curve. But some patients still need to be talked to or just have hand-holding in a virtual manner or just have their records reviewed. And so those patients we have been talking to on the telephone and also switching to virtual neuro-ophthalmology. And you might think that neuro-ophthalmology would not be a good subspecialty to switch to virtual. However, amazingly, we've been able to do a lot with just the tools we have. With the virtual neuro-ophthalmology apps that are available, patients at home can test their visual acuity, can test their color vision, and test their visual field. Some of these visual field apps are available online and only require an iPad to use, and newer uh, software and hardware is coming down the line to allow us to use PCs. In addition, we're still able to look at their chart, look at their scans, and do everything that we need to do through the EPIC system, and your individual EMR also might be able to switch over to a virtual appointment. So I think we've been able to do a lot in this time of crisis. We've been able to make the diagnosis of downbeat nystagmus, of a six nerve palsy, of INO, and efferent disease, as you can imagine, from the ocular motility standpoint, is a lot easier to diagnose. Of course, we don't have a fundus exam, we don't have an intraocular pressure measurement, and we don't really have an exam face-to-face -face in terms of the tools that we use in the clinic, like the SLAM, but it's better than nothing. So it's changed a lot, and I think it's going to continue to change, but I've been very impressed with what we've been able to do so far. So in our clinic, we're an academic teaching institution. We have residents and fellows. All our medical students were sent home. So it's just the resident and the fellow. We maintain the six foot social distancing even in the clinic. And our lanes are quite small. And so sometimes that means leaving the door open. We tell the patient that's what we're doing and they seem fine with it. We also ask the patient not to speak in the room and we try to not speak when the, uh, we're in the room and, and close together. We try to do it outside. In addition, we're all wearing the masks and we have the shields, the breath shields on the slit lamp. And we have made some effort to keep our patients down to a minimum. And even when we're on rounds, we do that virtually through Zoom. Uh, our grand rounds, our morning report, all of the activities from the teaching standpoint, we're using virtual for that. So things have changed a lot from the teaching side and also from the at the bedside teaching standpoint and I think those changes are going to have to stay with us for a long time. In addition, one of the things that has really impressed me is our ability to teach was not diminished during this time and I think we're doing actually more than we were able to do. Number one, we have more time because our clinic is less full, but number two, it really has brought us together as a team. I think that if we all just stayed at home and did nothing, it would be way worse than trying to maintain some normalcy and learn from the cases that we have and use the time effectively for some things that we couldn't do before, including writing papers and helping mentor medical students virtually. And so from this darkness, I think there's gonna be some light. And I think that is gonna change things that we do forever.